Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Jessica Kim Cohen, Senior Writer Reporter with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Also throughout today's webinar, we will have a few survey questions for the audience. The survey questions will pop up directly on your screen and you can select your answer from the options and click submit. Additionally, in about a week following the webinar, we will be sending you a copy of the presentation to the email you used to register. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Sharon Rojo is an SPD Educational Coordinator for HealthMark. Mr. Rojo is a Certified Registered Central Service Technician, Certified Instrument Specialist, Certified Endoscope Reprocessor, Certified Flexible Endoscope Reprocessor, and a Certified Healthcare Leader. He served on the Professional Development Resource Committee for IAHCSMM, as well as the Educational Director for the California Central Service Association. Mr. Rojo has 27 years in the sterile processing arena as a sterile processing technician, SPD educator, an instrument coordinator, and a surgical technologist in the surgical realm. I will now turn the floor over to Mr. Rojo to begin today's presentation. Well, thank you, Jessica, for the introduction. I have a lot of certified uh, are back on my name there, I can see, um, but I've been in the field, like Jessica is saying, uh, it's 27 years in the field, and um, would like to get right into the presentation. Next slide, please. So there is some disclosures. I am an employee of Healthmark Industries in Fraser, Michigan. I am involved with the manufacture and distribution of medical products to healthcare facilities and healthcare professionals. Um, all opinions are those of myself. This presentation does reflect the techniques, approaches, and opinions of myself. This sponsored presentation is not intended to be used as a training guide or promotion. And before using any medical device, review all relevant package inserts for the device or devices. Next slide, please. Healthmark um, has a policy and philosophy and it is to provide our customers and the healthcare community with the highest quality state-of-the-art medical products and support services in a timely and cost-effective manner. This goal is supported by staff committed to individual accountability, professionalism, mutual respect, collaboration, and service excellence. This presentation is part of that commitment education, um, educating our customers. Philosophy for HealthMark is more than just running a test. It is a quality improvement process, clinically relevant, evidence-based products, support of products both clinically and educationally. Next slide, please. We will now have our first survey question. You can select your answer from the options and click Submit. Our first question is, who is attending today? SPD professionals, OR professionals, infection prevention professionals, endoscopy professionals, or other professionals. Wow, that's really nice. I got to uh, see here that we have infection prevention, 32%. Uh, so thank you, welcome for coming in everyone. Infection prevention professionals are very dear to my heart. Um, they have helped many, many times in SPD and OR with a lot of different issues, and this would be one of them. And we'll talk a little bit about those stories, but thank you everyone um, that is going to listen to this webinar today. So next slide, please. So why talk about this topic? There's so many topics obviously to present, but surgical instruments are one of the largest dollar assets of a hospital or department. I've been to small hospitals, which could have, you know, 500 something thousand dollar instruments from a small clinic to millions of dollars of inventory in your larger hospitals. Next slide, please. So the objectives today is we're gonna briefly explain the history of instrument design and their function. We're gonna define what the majority of instrumentation are made of, explain the role of inspection in the protection of instrumentation, 
explain the importance of why you should protect them and how. And understanding all these points will help you reduce your repairs, protect your instruments, and make them last longer. Next slide, please. So a brief history of instruments. In the 1950s, general dissection was really happening there with stainless steel. Long life, instruments were made primarily of heat-stable materials. In 1959, the first flexible endoscope came out. In 1960s through the 70s, metal, increasing complexity, new sterilization cycles, phase age material was being used, prol proliferation, or pro I mean, talk now, proliferation of heat sensitive items, increasing complexity and delicacy. Late 1970s, take aparts started to enter the market. In the 1980s through today, stainless steel that ranges from simple to complex various metals, titanium, polymers, and combination of materials, highly complex design, lots of lumens, delicate and expensive. I entered the field as an SPD technician in the mid 90s, so I'm gonna show my age. Um, and back then, laparoscopic was the latest thing and doing things more laparoscopically than open. Back then, we had first generation laparoscopic that didn't even come apart and basically was just washing it and saying some prayers and hopefully it was clean. And we've come a long way today. Look, now laparoscopic instruments can actually completely uh, be taken apart or they're disposables. Next slide, please. Now, why some of these changes? Well, we had advancements in technology with procedures, surgical technique changed. So we went from open surgery to laparoscopic. It went all the way around from basic surgeries to GYN, um, all the way down to orthopedic. And orthopedic now was going from open to laparoscopic arthroscopies. Cardiac surgery was using not just metal instrumentation, but they were using instruments that were made of different materials. And of course, robotics came into the picture, which now it's going into more service lines. When I first got to see my first robotics, I got to see them actually do a demo on a pig's heart that was actually using for heart surgeries. Now, you see that used in GYN, urology. And with these instruments comes very complex cleaning and complex, actually, um, tip uh, protection with those. Next slide, please. These changes brought concerns as well. So great, it was less trauma to the patient, but the concerns were actually with design challenges. Reprocessing is not on the top priority of instrument design and cleaning difficulty was there. No validated process as well. I remember years ago calling a pretty well-known vendor for trauma with orthopedics, and I was doing a paper uh, for college and kind of looking at how has this all come into play with design and how are they made and why are they a certain color? And I was sadly kind of uh, looking when calling is when I talked to one of the main groups that um, would design the trays, and I asked them, well, how do you come up with like the little feet or the colors or with the different layers? Sadly, I actually got told that they came up with sleek and sexy. And I'm not making that up. That is from a top vendor of trauma orthopedics. Hopefully things have changed because we've had struggles with the containers as well as the instrumentation. Processing instructions are vague. Sometimes they're incomplete. They're absent. The compatibility with sterilization processes that we have in our department, long narrow lumens, multiple parts, and tiny serrations have all been a factor. Next slide, please. Cost, more complex and delicate, leads to escalating financial impact. So basically, fewer trays you may have because you can't afford. Increased use, you have one or two trays, but you're using them you know, 20 times a day or 100 times a day. And of course, with that, because you're putting a pretty more use, or maybe the protection isn't there, increased repairs. The time constraint, uh, constraints, quick turnaround times is needed for this because you don't have enough in inventory. And then, of course, lack of respect for care and handling is also a factor. Next slide, please. Now, stainless steel. Um, basically is the most used type of metal in the instrument trays. And it's the most common with that. Simplest form is made up of carbon and iron. 
The higher the carbon, the harder the steel, and it can be made in different ways depending on the instrument use. Other elements are added to make the instrument stronger when needed. Stainless steel instruments are preferred because they can withstand the rigorous use as well as the exposure to processing with steam sterilization. Next slide, please. So let's go into a little bit of the basic with instrumentation. Passivation. Now, this passivation is a chemical process that removes all iron particles, leaving a corrosion resistant surface by forming a thin transparent oxide film. The passivation subjects the instrument to solution of diluted acid and oxidizing salts, which I actually got to see live um, one year when I was actually able to represent Isham at the Ascalot manufacturing plant in Germany. And this was really interesting and it takes time and it's part of the many steps, obviously, to make an instrument itself. Next slide, please. Now the Paul, <clears throat> Sorry, uh, the polishing um, is basically protecting this passivation layer when they're making this part of the instrument and promoting its continued buildup is an important objective of instrument care. If the oxidized layer is destroyed or damaged, the instrument will have a greater tendency to rust. Next slide, please. Now the care and handling. Instrumentation should be carefully handled and removed from instrument trays and processing baskets. Many times I've been in SPDs throughout the country and I see a lot of great techniques in decontam, but sometimes I see not the right basket being used. If you have delicate picks like you see in this picture on the left, you can see the picks are going right through the basket. They weren't placed that way, but with the strong impingement of your washers or moving around or shifting the racks onto a conveyor belt can actually make the instrument move into the holes. So selecting a basket is important and selecting maybe something with a smaller hole. Also organizing the basket to where things are in the same direction, heavier on the bottom, lighter on top. They should never be dumped onto work tables on the clean side, as you see in the picture on the right. I see all this care being taken, um, taken in with on the decontam side, but on the clean side, I'll see a technician actually dump the whole tray that's been really nicely organized onto a metal, hard metal surface. This damages all the instruments, as well as damaging the instruments as you're trying to take them out. Next slide, please. So how do you protect your instrument? Well, there's different ways to do that. Inspection is one. You have tray liners that you could use for your trays, tip protectors of all kinds, which we'll go over, specialty trays for specialty instruments, and of course, team training and education. Next slide, please. So what we'll be getting into is inspection of instrumentation. Next slide, please. We'll now have our second survey question. The question is, how many of you have some sort of adequate magnification device for external surfaces at your workstation to inspect instrumentation correctly? That is good to see that 81% said no and 19%, I mean, said yes and 19% said no. That's really good to hear because I do travel quite a bit and I do see at the workstations maybe one um, or maybe not at all. So I'm really glad that it's, it's pretty high. So great, thank you. So there is standards and guidelines to support the practice of inspection with enhanced visual inspection tools. Next slide, please. So AORN, tools such as video bore scopes of an appropriate dimension, length and diameter, may be used to visually inspect the internal channels. Internal channels of endoscopes may be inspected using a bore scope. Bore scopes penetrate the lumen and allow the improved visual inspection. Amy ST91, tools such as the video bore scopes of an appropriate dimension, length, and diameter may be used to visually inspect the intended channels of some medical devices. Amy ST79, inspection using enhanced visualization tools such as lighted magnification, 
and video borescopes might identify residues not observable by the unaided eye. The picture on the bottom left I just took on a visit about a month ago, this is actually the control piece or the control head of a flexible GI scope. I use the bore scope. The bore scope doesn't necessarily have to go down the channels. It can also be used for other piece or other um, inspection points of the device. Here you can see that there's actually an epoxy coming off and these are actually one of the seals that have gone bad. So this is a perfect example of using in your enhanced visual inspection. Um, can you go back one slide please, Jessica? The picture on the far left was taken with the same scope. As you can see here, I use the same bore scope at the distal tip. Now, what you see there looks like it looks like the epoxy kind of melted or burned or crusted and it's going into the next lens. I really don't know. But again, it's to show you the detail of how close you could see on a particular device. Um, next slide, please, or next couple slides. Thank you. So Cigna. Inspection may involve the use of a magnifying glass to inspect for gross soil. Visual inspection alone is insufficient to determine cleaning adequacy in narrow and internal channels of a scope and um, cannot detect microorganisms of bio burden. Use magnification and adequate lighting to help assist in visual inspection. It's almost like a timeout for the OR um, that can relate to that for visual inspection. The CDC also has things to say. In, saying consideration should be given to use of a magnifying glass 10 times the magnification to improve detection of residue debris around elevator mechanisms, really referring to the duanoscope with all the issues surrounding that. And you would need something this detailed in magnification because of the small detail at the distal tip with the lever. APIC, the IP will evaluate human factors, including ensuring that the cleaning area is set up with a bright light and magnification. So all sections of the board um, of the scope being clean can be well visualized. So IP, you might wanna go look at your SPDs and look to see if there is some type of magnification in doing this. Next slide. Our next survey question is, how many of you have a flexible inspection scope to inspect internal lumen devices for example, shavers or GI endoscopes. Okay, so we have 26% yes and 74% no. Well, this is, you know, really low. Um, definitely looking at your guidelines and looking at different ways of how you can implement that in your department is very beneficial. As you can see with some of the pictures that I had shown with my travels, um, I've seen a lot and these bore scopes or detailed magnification are very helpful um, to view that. Next slide, please. So inspection of instrumentation, we're gonna go over some basic points. Before assembly, you wanna inspect the instruments for pits, cracks, bent tips, and misalignment or corrosion. As you can see here on the top right, I took this about a month ago, you can see some corrosion in this scissor. On the bottom left, you'll see that I use a type of magnification to look at a forcep, and with the naked eye, there's no way you can see all those scratches that you see on the far right. And that's really bad. There's no way I could actually see that. I felt a little bit on the forcep, but I didn't know to what extent the damage was. Next slide, please. Now, make sure that moving parts work freely and that the instruments are in perfect operating condition. Again, there's different types of magnification out there and you wanna make sure you select the right one for your department. It may be one or you may have to select a few different types for the types of instruments or devices that you're looking at. As you can see here on the left-hand picture, I'm using a magnifier to simply just stand, uh, freestanding there to put instruments through to be able to view it on top. You want to make sure, like on the bottom right, visually looking at this forcep, I really didn't see that it was bent a little bit. But under magnification, as you can see, as I circled, you can see that slight bent, which is very important. 
On the top right, I also want to add that testing your scissors and instrumentation in general with all the um, testing that's recommended by the IFU of the instrument vendor is very important. Now, a scissor here may cut clear and clean, but you want to make sure that it doesn't snag, and if it does snag, it's going dull. One thing to keep in mind that a scissor can cut clear, I mean clean, but it also could be making a noise or it's very rough in cutting. This makes sure that you take it out for repair because there comes, it could be actually something lodged in the box lock in that area, or there could be some damage. Next slide, please. So depending on your department procedure, tag and remove rejected instruments from trays. I've been in facilities where the OR actually has availability to be able to do this, um, or an SPD or both. So making sure that you're looking at your procedure to make sure you're doing it appropriately. You also want to follow the OEM, the Original Equipment Manufacturer of the Instruments IFU Instructions for Use for proper inspection process. Now, different OEMs have different requirements for inspection of their instruments and making sure that you're looking at the list of what you're looking for. It could be range from sharpness to alignment or any other areas on the device. Next slide, please. Our next survey question is, do you feel at your facility that you have a solid process for the checking of instrumentation that need repair? So we have 66% saying yes, that's good, and 34 no. So that's nice to know that you actually have a good process in place. Next slide, please. So you wanna make sure that assemble instruments in trays in accordance with department procedures. There could be a standardization of some kind that it tells you that you must set this from left to right, a place from top to bottom. So make sure you're doing that to procedure. Load instrumentation in a way to dispense the weight evenly in the tray um, for sterilization as well as any type of injuries. Total weight of the instrument set should not exceed 25 pounds or a weight documented by the manufacturer of the sterilizer or container system. Next slide, please. You want to wrap um, like metals together such as copper or brass and stainless steel chrome plated instruments together uh, where practical using tray liners or towels to separate when necessary. Here's some examples in these pictures of different ways you can separate as well as different products that are out there. Next slide, please. Place ring handle instruments on stringers, pins, or racks to keep them open. Point claps, uh, clamps with curved jaws in the same direction to protect the tips. This is one area that I see in my travels that I'll see them going all over the place where they actually the curve is actually going front to back and they're all mixed up. This damages the instruments as well as very frustrating on the ORN when you're trying to set up when your instruments are actually being tangled and you're trying to pull them out and there actually can be room to actually drop them or contaminate the back field. Position cupped or concave instruments to avoid water collection as well. Next slide, please. Wrap the smallest, delicate, and sharp cutting instrumentation in either woven or non-woven towels or other specially designed patches, uh, pouches, as you can see here in the picture. Use a medical grade silicone ties to bundle instruments together like you see on the top right. Um, and make sure rubber bands should not be used to hold instruments together. And I still see facilities using rubber bands and you cannot do that. Next slide, please. Protect the tips that are, are sharp with protectors that can be sterilized as well. As you can see in this slide, I try to put a variety of tip protectors that can be used either in pill packs or actually in the trays. It's really important that you know which ones can be used where, which tip protectors can be used um, for the right instrument. And you want to always check with the IFU of the manufacturer of the tip protector to make sure you're using it on the correct instrument or device. Many times I go into um, to facilities and I'll open random fuel packs 
And before I can even open it, the tip protector has already fallen off. Or I can't get the tip protector off at all without using really strong force. It's really important for aseptic technique in the OR that the tip protector is put on correctly because you can also, on the other end, contaminate the field or I can actually earn, um, injure myself as a scrub, which I've done before, where maybe a skin hook couldn't come out of a vented tip protector. So again, when looking at selections of tip protectors and you want to evaluate new ones, make sure that you include the OR so they know um, what type of um, selections are being looked at, as well as not just um, looking at vented and non-venting, but also the color. The color is very important at times. I've been in facilities where the OR didn't know that they went from colored to a clear, which is absolutely fine, but because the OR wasn't told, um, they actually dropped or left the uh, tip protector inside the, um, the instrument itself and it dropped into the patient. Luckily, they were able to retrieve it. But again, it's also very important to let them know. Next slide, please. Our next survey question is, how many of you feel you have enough of a selection of instrument protection products at your facility? So good, we have 65% that says yes and 35% that says no. But again, if you do wanna look at a bigger selection, always go to your vendor um, for your tip protectors and actually shop around and look to see what can meet your need. Every facility and department is different, but again, I can't um, stress enough to involve your OR. Next slide, please. So you wanna choose the correct type of instrument tray. A 2014 report showed the larger the instrument tray, the greater the incidence of instrument damage. This is a great report uh, by Emily Stockard um, that goes over in detail a study on how instrument damage comes about. In here, she talks about, moreover, Greenberg and coworkers showed that a more streamlined instrument tray with fewer instruments can be both cost-effective and safe for patients and found that reducing the number of instruments in specific trays had no effect on surgical procedure time. Excessive time spent counting instruments in the operating room can significantly compromise case progression and patient safety by drawing attention away from the patient care activities. Quality or quantity of instruments included in a tray can greatly disrupt operating room flow, causing the surgeon to stand idle, with the patient under anesthesia and requiring the circulating nurse to leave the room to replace broken or missing instruments. Next slide, please. She go on, uh, goes on to write, the trays designed to protect delicate instruments provide real measurable results according to the survey. Choosing the correct type of tray for all types of instrumentation, procedures, and sterilization methods will save money in the long run. Now, in my view, instrument repairs and replacement costs can go up with trays that are not evaluated, and I always believe yearly, or to be separated. You need to look at surgeons who leave and, and maybe come back, or new surgeons coming on board. I have found in my travels that if the trays aren't evaluated at least yearly, you'll find that the trays start building up and building up to the point where the tray becomes so heavy that you'll actually have back injuries. Um, or it can actually compromise your back table because the pan, the insert itself is too heavy. So you want to make sure that you look at the instrument saying, well, this certain surgeon left and they only like to use this one forcep, but the other surgeons don't like it. But maybe that's something that needs to either come out completely, or maybe it's something that's individually peel packed. So examples of this, um, recently um, the last position I held was an instrument coordinator. And I did look at a couple of trays before I left to help Mark to make sure that these trays were done correctly because they were actually getting really heavy. Now, in doing this, we actually looked at our craniotomy trays, and you can look at any trays from orthopedic and, and such, but we decided to focus on craniotomy trays. And these, this one tray was so heavy that it was getting difficult to actually put them on the sterilization racks. It was time consuming to actually separate and decontam. It was time consuming actually to 
actually and visually inspect everything and all the lumens. So we actually got a task force together. So we have a representative from SPD, a representative of the OR, like a scrub tech, and the service um, team leader in neuro to evaluate the tray. In doing so, what we came out out of after this meeting was we decided to separate the tray into two separate trays. One would be a craniotomy retractor tray that would have all the heavy instruments from retractors to rongeurs. In the other tray was a craniotomy instrument tray that would hold the general instrumentation and all the delicate um, items that would be actually into a pouch or secured. We decided to actually separate the insulated bipolar forceps that in this particular tray was inside and it was getting damaged quite frequently. So we decided to put this in a small container system. So again, this is an example of working together as a team to evaluate the trays. And we did a few more after this, but again, it takes a team approach to do this. Next slide, please. Our next survey question is, how many of you have instrument trays that are overly crowded? So we have 58% yes and 42% no. Okay, so it's kind of in the middle. But you know, everyone has some sort of tray that's pretty heavy. But again, I really recommend going back and doing a team approach on evaluating um, your trays and actually coming up with some kind of a policy and procedure to look at these annually. Next slide, please. So there's many types of trays to choose from. Here's a few for an example. On the top left, this is a, a container that can be used maybe for some type of light instrument or an abrader, um, or it can be used for something that has a set, meaning it only has two items versus a whole tray. The top right can be used maybe for eye instrumentation, something that needs to be more secured, or maybe some ENT items that have picks, sharp edges. The bottom left, uh, left as you can see here, have robotic, robotic arms but it can also be used for laparoscopic, something that needs the instruments to be very secure and not being, being able to move. The bottom right can be used for something for rigid scopes or a set of rigid scopes. What I see usually in my travel is that there is the right container being used, but what I find is that they're not upkeep, um, doing upkeep with the container, meaning on the bottom right, I'll see a base and a lid, but then I'll see the inserts gone. So the scope that's very delicate, it's still moving around or I'll see the bottom base broken on the side, or I'll see just the bottom base and no lid. Just make sure that when you're um, selecting um, the right container that you're looking at uh, the upkeep as well. Next slide, please. Now it goes into pick the right container for the right reason. Size and weight of the instrumentation is the factor. For an example, if you have a book, Walter, we all know that book, Walter instrumentation are very heavy. And you'll find that the manufacturer of the book, Walter item itself with the instruments for those, or there's other ones out there that actually sell containers for those, making sure you're choosing the right one. Meaning if you're choosing one that holds all the rings and the posts, that's great. And you can separate all the attachments and all the blades into another. So basically you're separating into two trays. Now the tray does come out to being heavy, but if you have everything in one tray, that's really, really heavy. Making sure that you're using some type of book walter as well with not just a flash pan. I've been in my travels seeing flash pans used for these instruments where they move around. And I've personally hurt my back on this years ago. So making sure you're using something that secures those instruments. Sterilization method and size of chamber is a factor because you might buy a container and it's maybe just for ETO, but you don't carry an ETO sterilizer. Or let's say your ETO sterilizer has a small chamber. So the container you purchase doesn't fit. So make sure you work with your vendor on the container to make sure you evaluate that. Purchase as a whole. Now, for an example, the lid and the insert might be sold separately. I've been in this and helping in purchasing containers, and I've made mistakes in looking at the wrong um, product number, or I didn't get a hold of my vendor to actually come in and tell me that all four parts were separate or they're actually sold as a whole. Next slide, please. 
Now there is support for protecting your instrumentation that's found in ST79 for instruments and tray liners to tip protectors and stringers. And these are all found in section 8.2. Next slide, please. Education is essential because SPD and OR teams must understand why you protect instrumentation and why it must be performed every time. Protection saves money in the long run and it might increase your budget. It might increase your budget, but it will reduce your repair costs as well. On the top right in that picture there, there was a burr found with a magnification, which with the naked eye, I wasn't able to find that. And I found that about a month ago. On the bottom right, I see some really nice tip protectors for rigid scopes that are out there. But what I find is that they have the right protection, but on both sides, OR may not reattach the tip protector on the rigid scope in transport, or sometimes I'll find that SPD may not supply the tip protector um, with the scope um, in sterilization. So I've seen both um, sides of that coin. Next slide, please. Now, in summary, you want to understand what you want, uh, want to protect. You have many choices out there. You want to work with your customers and teams, work with your vendors and reps on this. Teamwork will always work, and this is only one piece of the protection process. Next slide, please. Properly maintained surgical instruments during daily use is essential to keeping instrumentation in top working condition. The utilization of instrument protection devices and packaging aids can ensure the maximum utilization and extended life of costly surgical instruments. The care of critical surgical instruments lies in the expert hands of sterile processing technicians and the surgical team. Their attention to detail and following proper care and handling procedures will ensure that safe and high quality instrumentation are in the surgeon's hands, contributing to the best quality patient care outcome. Next slide, please. And I wanna say thank you for everyone for attending today's webinar. Thank you for that fantastic presentation. We will now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We will, we will try to get through as many questions as we have time for. Our first question is, our surgery department won't separate the trays and wants everything in it. I've tried to ask to separate the trays, but I get nowhere with this issue. They continue to add more instruments to the trays and it's getting harder to lift them. What do you suggest I do? Well, again, um, I had discussed about having a team approach with this. The other thing that you can have is I, instead <clears throat> with also adding your team um, and having the correct rest representation from SPD and OR is also if you have any incident reports with any type of injuries with lifting the trays from the OR end and SPD, that can also help. But again, getting a team approach on this and sitting down and discussing not just weight, but also the tray itself. Are there certain instruments that I need? Are there some that aren't used every so often that can be taken out individually, peel packed or containerized? But again, a team approach is what I have to say about that. Thanks so much for going over that. Our next question is, you talked about keeping instruments organized, but is there any guidelines to how a tray should be set up? For example, left to right, what should go in a multi-pouch, et cetera? Okay, well, if you're talking about more in detail, meaning standardizing your tray and how it goes from left to right to top to bottom like I discussed a little bit. You know, basically it goes back to the customer. The customer, which is the OR, the end user, typically comes up with the standard setup, meaning they go by procedure. So for an example, your first forceps may be a towel clip or something to drape off um, the patient or the drapes themselves, and then so on and so on. In your pouches, it may be your knife handle because you actually have to cut first and then the next step is to retract and maybe a scissor, a met scissor to actually dissect. So again, you might wanna get a team approach on this um, and sit down and look from the customer standpoint and SPD to come up with some type of standardization for the tray and use that as a role model going forward throughout all your service line and trays in SPD. Thanks for clarifying that. 
Our next question is, we use tip protectors at our facility when peel pouching, but how do we know if we are using the correct size or style for our instruments? So again, I, I had discussed a little bit about that. So you wanna make sure you contact your vendor who supplies your tip protectors and they should have a list of examples of what types of instruments that they could be used on based on the IFU. Also be aware when looking at bringing in new tip protectors, like I was stating before, to make sure the OR is included in this evaluation to make sure there's no any, um, any mishaps. Um, and also making sure that um, that they are, they actually look at everything that's out there and shopping around and looking and looking at, do I need a color? Do I need vented and such? But again, you want to just make sure you look at a team approach on this as well. It looks like we have time for one more question. Our next question is, we purchased containers recently and they don't fit the instrumentation we bought the containers for. How do we know what size or style we need? Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I've been in that situation as well. But usually you can reach out to your container or instrument vendors and they can actually come out and go over your needs and measure the instruments, measure the tray and give you possible solutions to your issue. And I think that's really the best advice I can give you with that is making sure that you involve them. But um, also uh, there is instrument vendors out there they can actually assist and like to add to this um, doing research for you and reorganizing your instrument trays and giving you su suggestions on how to consolidate or actually separate your trays. So there's actually instrument vendors that provide a, a nice program for this. So reach out to your vendors to see if they provide assistance with that. Thank you so much for going over that. It looks like that is all the time we have for today. I want to thank Sharon Rojo and Healthmark for the excellent presentation and to our audience for participating today. Enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.